today's video we examine the very hard to find Warhammer 40,000 chapter approved Book of the Astronomicon, a rare companion book for Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader published way back in 1988. Well, hi everybody, this is Lee from SkirmishWarGames.com. Welcome to the channel. If you're a fan of tabletop miniature wargaming, then no doubt you've heard of Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader, the first Warhammer 40k rulebook written by gaming legend Rick Priestley and published by Games Workshop way back in 1987. Now, even though I was playing Warhammer 40,000 back in the late 80s and the early 90s, and had purchased my own copy of Rogue Trader from a local comic book store, I was not aware that in 1988, Games Workshop actually published a companion book to Rogue Trader, which was called Warhammer 40,000 Chapter Approved Book of the Astronomicon. The Book of the Astronomicon is pretty hard to find, and as you can see, my copy here is falling apart. So I thought it would be a pretty good idea to review it now for posterity before it completely disintegrates. I should mention here that even though this book is 30 years old and out of print, it's still the IP of Games Workshop. So we're reporting on it because of its historical significance to both the gaming community and to popular culture in general. To begin, I'll quote this little blurb from the back cover. The Book of the Astronomicon is the first companion to the Warhammer 40k rulebook and will prove invaluable to both GMs and players alike. That's a little reminder there that Warhammer 40k was often played with a game master back in the day. Within its pages, you'll find a complete mini campaign in four parts, a definitive full-color photographic guide to all the Warhammer 40k miniatures currently available, and six ready-to-use army lists. Can you leave the shop without a copy? Unquote. The Book of the Astronomicon back cover also includes an updated and corrected weapon summary, prepared and approved by the Adeptus Mechanicus, which features the all-new Shuriken Pistol, as well as old favorites such as the Musket and Sling, the Sawn-Off Shotgun, and the Weber. The Table of Contents page has an intro by Rick Priestley himself, where he talks about uh, upcoming releases such as the game's first plastic vehicles, uh, new box sets, and uh, the Realm of Chaos and Warhammer Siege books. There's also a little 40k trivia about the most poisonous recorded creature in the Imperium, the Great Barking Toad of Catachan. The book's contents include a full multi-part Warhammer 40k campaign pitting space wolves against orc strongholds, then there's a complete full-color Warhammer 40k miniatures guide, and six army lists covering the White Scar Space Marine chapter, the Imperial Army, a rogue trader entourage, Pirates from the Claw Nebula, an Orc Legion, and Eldar Raiders. There's also a painting guide and some ready-made Imperial characters. The first section in the Book of the Astronomicon is a four-part Warhammer 40k campaign entitled The Wolf Time, which is set up for at least two players and a Game Master, though it can accommodate more than one player per side. The campaign concerns the battle for the planet Zit, XIT, which was a pre-Imperium human colony, but is now controlled by Orcs. The Space Wolves are on a five-year mission to cleanse this subsector, so now they have to dislodge the Orcs from the planet. The Orc Governor's stronghold is shielded by a power field, so the Space Wolves have to destroy three power generator stations before making the final assault on Kulo's castle. Each generator scenario has its own layout and special conditions, with the Game Master being privy to certain information that none of the players have. In the campaign's final scenario, the Space Wolves attempt to invade the upper and lower levels of Kulo's castle. The extensive castle floor plan was made to be used with Games Workshop's Dungeon Rooms and Dungeon Floor Plan RPG tiles, though players could always improvise if they didn't have those sets. The next section of the book is a general introduction to the army lists, but before we get to the actual armies, there's this fantastic full-color guide to all of the Warhammer 40k miniatures supposedly available at the time of publication. This is a really amazing historical look at some of the early days of 40k, so we'll go through it page by page. This of course is the original Plastic Space Marines box set. $9.99 buys you 30 of the most feared warriors in the galaxy. And here we have late 1980s Metal Space Marines, Imperial Dreadnoughts, and Jet Bikes. Interestingly, a lot of these Metal Marines have specific names like Brother Dixon, Brother Angst, and Brother Thaw. Here's a closer look at the first generation Metal Imperial Dreadnoughts. Next, we move on to some metal Space Orcs. I actually purchased one of these Space Orc Creator box sets back when it first came out, but unfortunately did not hold on to it. Here's some more metal orky goodness. These guys all have names. I believe I still have all the pieces for this uh, metal Space Orc Dreadnought, with the possible exception of the back banner post. 
This was new to me. I'd never seen these Warhammer 40k mercenaries before. You might start to notice a theme here. We had space marines, then space orcs, now we have space dwarves. As you'll see in a couple of minutes, the squats actually feature prominently in both the Imperial Army and the Space Pirate Army lists. Now here we have Space Elves, Zotes, and some wily Space Pirates from a brand called Iron Claw, which I think was uh, rolled in the Citadel a few years later. In the Book of the Astronomicon, the Eldar are portrayed as either pirate mercenaries and or raiders in their own right. I actually have some late 1980s Warhammer Space Pirates, but I've never seen these guys. They must be pretty rare. So before the Astro Militarum and before the Imperial Guard, we had the Imperial Army. You'll note that there's both a beast man and a couple of female soldiers serving in the ranks. I still have one of these figures, but I didn't know he was the first of the Ogren. So the Devastator's box set was kind of unusual. It came with a Imperial Speeder, a Tarantula mobile weapons platform, and a uh, squat mole mortar. Somebody at GW must have had a thing for Vincent Motorcycles. And finally we come to the uh, Space Elf Command Group and the Imperial Army Jump Troopers. I'll just say that Space Elf Command has a lot of musicians. And lastly Iron Claw presents Imperial Army Grunts with Power Armor and Jump Packs. Now we get back to the Army lists, starting with the White Scar Space Marine Chapter. The book says that the White Scars are organized in a classic fashion and as such can be used as a template for any generic Space Marine army list. Now we move on to the Imperial army list which amazingly is almost 50-50 humans and squats. It seems like for every human unit there is a reciprocal unit of Space Dwarves. The next army list is a Rogue Trader's Entourage. A Rogue Trader is kind of like a conquistador. He goes out into deep space to pillage, conquer, and or eradicate in the name of the Emperor along with a cohort of marines, regular soldiers, and squats. The next army list is for Claw Nebula Pirates, which the book describes as semi-military hooligans who are uh, basically allied with squat clans and higher Eldar mercenaries and uh, do whatever is necessary to uh, turn a buck, I guess. Now the book takes a brief intermission from the army list to talk about prepping and painting all of those snazzy models that it featured in the Full Color Miniatures Guide. Now it's back to the army list with this orc task force. Apparently orcs had commissars before the Imperium did, plus something called a discipline master. Now we're on to the army list for the Eldar pirates. Apparently the space elves in this game are either pirates or uh, mercenaries working for human pirates. And they can deploy Zote terror squads, which uh, sounds like bad news. And because every campaign needs heroes and villains, the book provides a list of pre-made Imperial characters ranging from assassins to inquisitors to rogue traders. And then finally, the book of the Astronomicon ends with Rick Priestley answering a few letters and questions about uh, Warhammer 40k, and also lamenting uh, the limitations of white metal vehicles and how expensive it is to make them out of plastic. We also get an illustration of a Terminogre and what appears to be an ad for uh, the first edition of Blood Bowl, if I'm not mistaken. And with that, our historical review of the Book of the Astronomican comes to an end. I wonder if the squats know that uh, they're going to go from being 50% of the Imperial Army down to just a memory, a legend. Perhaps they're still fighting alongside the Space Pirates or the Claw Nebula. We can only hope. But uh, regardless, we hope you enjoyed this look at the Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader Companion Book from 1988. If you like what we do here, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please give this video a big thumbs up. And please visit us online at our website, skirmishwargames.com.